22 verse 13 then jesus went out to lake shore again and taught the crowds that were coming to him as he walked along he saw levi son of alphaeus sitting at his tax collector's booth follow me and be my disciple jesus said to him so levi got up and followed him later levi invited jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners there were many people of this kind among Jesus' followers. But when the teachers of the religious law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he told them, Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Once, when John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, some people came to Jesus and asked, Why don't your disciples fast like John's disciples and the Pharisees do? Jesus replied, Do wedding guests fast while celebrating with a groom? Of course not. They can't fast while the groom is with them, but someday the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. Besides, who would patch old clothing with new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the wine would burst the wineskins, and the wine and the skins would both be lost. New wine calls for new wine skins. And this is the word of the Lord. When we began this series, in the first few weeks of January, I spoke about the sense of our church, the sense of this family, being in a holding pattern for the last year. You see, you have to forgive me. This is my first global pandemic as a pastor. It's just, you have to forgive me. Like, I've not led through a global pandemic before. It's my very first one. Never done it before. So, so I'm thank you for your grace in the first year. Just didn't know what was going on, but really felt the ministry was kind of in a holding pattern for the first year. Yet, as we came to the beginning of this year, I said, Lord, what are we doing? Because as I look forward, as I look forward, I just can't see anything changing for a while. It's, it's overwhelming for me. Lord, what do we do? Do we just kind of just keep in this holding pattern? And I felt the Lord say to me, Kevin, I want you to move ahead. I want you as a church family and your people to move ahead. I want us to move ahead, that stop going around in circles and start heading to the de destination that I've called this church to go. And I felt that in my heart that we need to be have a year of building, that we need to move ahead in what God has called us to do. That's where we got our verse from. Let your lives be built on him. That's an action. We've discovered early that, that the, the building of God is something that God is doing as a verb as well as the word can be used as a noun that we are his building, but he is building his building. And we've talked about that over the last few weeks. So, so we began at the beginning of this year as we just sort of parked the RV right on these verses, just kind of rolled up in the big RV, stopped, put out the awning, and said, we're going to stay here for a little while. We got out, we've been looking around, and we've been learning and dis exploring and, and found some really wonderful things as we've just parked on this building theme. If you've missed any of these messages, I want you to know that you can go to our YouTube page. Our YouTube page is called Yorkton Dream Center Church, Church and you'll see YouTube. all the messages of this year there. They're categorized. They're, they're in order from Sunday, Sunday. In fact, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get, take them and then edit them so you just have this talking, the talk part from every week. It's about 30, 35 minutes every week, and we're going to try to build our YouTube page. Tony and I are talking about how we can get better on using our Yorkton Dream Center Church YouTube page. Age. But as I was praying and asking uh, about what the Lord would have us learn and teach, uh, this one thing became clear to me. As we were talking about this year building, I said, Lord, what is the main thing that you want me to teach in this year building? Okay, you ready? Here's the main thing. Here's the main thing that I want you to take out of these series of sermons over this next year. Here it is. You are needed here. You are a separate, 
Say it with me. Separate and necessary part of the family of God, of what God is building. You, if you know Jesus, if you know the Lord, if you surrendered your life to him, you have a necessary Necessary, vital place. You have a vital place in his church family. You have a vital, if you know the Lord, you have a vital place in his church family. If you have not yet surrendered your life to the Lord, would you please? We need you. We need you. We, we need the, the family to be bigger. Because, you see, the, the Lord describes his, his church as a building, but he also describes it as a body. And he says on a regular basis that you are vital and necessary and that every part of the body has an important role, even if you don't think that your role is important. God would disagree with you greatly. In fact, he died on the cross. He paid that kind of penalty so that you could be a part of it. And you are necessary and needed and wanted and valued. And if you've never surrendered your life to Christ, then you are still wandering outside of God's intended purposes for your life to surrender to him and to be used of him because we are Christ's body. And we all are necessary. Would you surrender your life to Jesus? Would you? Even now? Would you, would you now? Simple to do. Just say, God, I surrender my life to you. I ask God that you come and you forgive me. I surrender to you. Please use me as part of your family. If you've done that, if you say that prayer, it's an amazing thing. God comes and he forgives us and he heals us and he invites us into his family. And you become part of this building that he is building. You become part of the family that he is using to reach and speak of his purposes to the world. But today it feels that even if people who know Jesus, they feel that, that life doesn't hold a lot of meaning to them. It seems that sadness is so much upon people these days that we wonder often what kind of life we're living. When I'm hearing the amount of suicide rates that is going on these days, when I hear amongst our Aboriginal communities just how many young people are taking their lives, I am screaming in my heart saying, where has the reason for living gone for people? Are people just thinking that they're here to be born, to, to, to get drunk, to, to, to make children or whatever, and then, and then somehow if they don't have any purpose, they just take their lives? What is it about this world today? Even people of faith are so absolutely distraught with purpose and meaning. Now, I know the world doesn't help with all this. You know, the Bible, the, the Bible says that you are created, but the world says you came from slime that you came evolved, that you came out of the ground, that you, that you kind of came, your ancestors were for something that crawled on the ground. There's not much purpose in life or meaning in that. But God says that he made you, that he created you to know him, that he made you as to be a part of his family, to, to take the things that you naturally have, and when you give them back to the Lord, God takes them, and he puts purpose in them and meaning. God has a plan, and he has a purpose, and he has a desire for everybody's life. Everybody here in the room, you're not just in this place to just fill space. You're not just in this world to just take time. You, you are here because a creator God designed you, knows every hair of your body, knows every hair of your head. He knows everything about you. He knows all things before you even had your first breath. And he says, I love you and I have purpose for you. And I have meaning. But you see, we've done something wrong. The thing I think we've done wrong above all things is that we have professionalized church. You know, this is one of the things why I'm kind of glad that we're having almost a church reboot with the whole things that's going on with COVID. Why? Be because there has become a professionalism that's come upon the church that we pay a professional to do the work of the ministry. We pay somebody. We don't have the gifts for it, so it's your job to come and sit to be as inactive as possible, but give, 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 
give, give, give, show up and give, give and show up, show up and give and show up and give. But then the rest, leave it to the professionals because we wouldn't want any amateurs out there doing God's work. And that is not what God designed this church to be. God did not design his church that, that the clergy, the professionalism of the church would do all the work and that the rest of the body of Christ would, be do, would do nothing. They would be the bottom of the family to just sit. We're not called to just sit. In fact, you are part of the crucial part of his body to do what? To be his voice, to be his heart, to be his plans to the world that's dying and sick and lost. And you stand in the midst of it all and say, you have a place here. You can have a spot here. God created you with meaning and purpose. God has got a great plan for you. And that is the voice of God is the voice that you speak with. In his book, Roaring Lambs, Bob Briner admits that he, though a professional sports executive, would ask himself the question, why am I even here? Have you ever asked yourself that? A Christian, a person who loves Jesus, loves the Lord, yet what's my purpose? He'd been led to believe all of his life that if a person had to be serving in full-time paid pastoral ministry... To make a difference. What a shame, he writes, that so many of us feel sort of in a fog between our faith and our careers. I'm convinced that many Christians, he says, have no idea about the possibility of being lambs that roar. That's the name of his book. The lambs that roar, being followers of God who know how to fully integrate their commitment to Christ into their daily lives. And I say, good word. Good word. God gave us, the body, his spirit, to empower you, to equip you, to be his building actively in the the building project. As we read today, what was Jesus' purpose for coming? I have come, he says, not to hang out with those that are well, but to those that they know. What was the words you used, Zita? that are the scum of the earth. Is that what you said? The scum of the earth? And that was like, wow, where, where, what what translation is that? Scum, scum of the earth. But so many people feel that way. And Jesus headed for those people. He hung out with them. The religious people were uncomfortable with his attention and love to those who didn't deserve it. And then Jesus leaves and says, you, my body, now follow my example. You go. You go, you go, that's where you're, that's your job. I need, if you don't go, the spirit is not going to go. You are my body. You be my feet, you go. But somehow something's happened where we as the building have become stationary, that we're not actively involved in doing what God has called us to do. And I feel responsible for that because I'm a pastor. And somehow in my preaching and teaching, I have developed a group of followers who will just passively listen and not actively engage. And I think it's not just me. I think that's kind of the way nature of Christian Christianity in North America. Actively sit. Actively do nothing. Actively passive. Actively avoid anything. But the Lord has given us his spirit to go and to be involved and to be active. He has given gifts in the body so that we can be his people wherever. Now remember, this sermon is not about doing more for God. No, it is to communicate on a regular basis to you. You are needed here. And that we as a church has a place in this city. And that God has called us to something in this city. And that we are to be actively involved in the mission of God for us. That is why we have been called together. So that God be glorified. That the body of Christ is strengthened. That the world know they are loved by God. And that we are fulfilled with joy and purpose and meaning as we move ahead in his kingdom. Okay, that's my preamble. So what do we do with verses like 1 Corinthians 12? Why don't you throw those up there if you can see them? Next one, next verses. 
there are different kind of spiritual gifts. Now remember, we talked about, we've been talking about this for the last few weeks. There's no way, as I'm trying to prepare this sermon, <laughs> there's no way that I'm going to be able to get through this stuff. This is a course. Like, this is a study. I can't get through all this, but I want to make the point. The point is that the scripture says that God has sent his spirit into his family, you, to do things. In fact, not only are you part of his body, but the Lord says that he's given gifts, that all these gifts are important for the building up, the building up of not only in the church, but his purposes in the world. So there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but there's the same Holy Spirit there, who is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service in the church, but it's the same Lord. Next verses, move ahead there. There are different kinds of God works in our lives, but it's the same God who does it uh, through all of us. A spiritual gift is given to, what does it say? Spiritual gift is given to e each of us. As a means, means is another word of purpose, for the purpose of what? Of helping the entire church. To one person, and then he goes to this list. So these are, there's different people that have put this together. In fact, why, can you put up that picture on that thing there? Uh, uh, that, that is just kind of a red slide there. Um, it, sh it should have been right in there. It is. So you, can, you, can you see that? I don't know if you can see that online. But you see this, this picture right here is like, here's the different places in the Bible which says, here are things that God has given to his church family. So he's got some in 1 Corinthians 12. That's where I'm in right now. There's some verses in Romans chapter 12. We read those last week. We talked about those verses last week uh, of encouragement and leadership and giving and mercy. And then there's some verses in, in 1 Peter chapter 4 as well. Uh, we're going to try to just quickly, we're just going to do a quick read of all of those really, really quickly. And then Matt next week is going to come to talk about the Ephesians 4 verses. Because Ephesians 4 verses to me, wow, they are a big deal. Oh, here, I'm just trying to jump into the camera for all you. <laughs> it was just the top of my head going on, just to be as beautiful. Uh, so Ephesians 4, we're going to get to those verses next week because those are a big, 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 big deal to me, and Matt's going to be preaching on those next week. So, okay, let's go back to those slides then in Corinthians there. We'll get over there to Corinthians in chapter, chapter 12, and so let's just quickly read through this list. One person to give the ability, okay, what, what's the ability? Can you see it with me? Give what? Okay, so that's one, okay. Uh, to another What's another one there? Special knowledge. Another one, special faith to another. Someone else, he gives what? Power to heal. Okay, so these are all supernatural gifts that God, now some of them may be natural in people's lives, but, but God infuses them. Remember what I said last week? That when you take the natural abilities you have and you give them back to the Lord, they find their fulfillment and purpose. And God develops them much more than what you could just do on your own. You may have this amazing ability. You just want to back up one slide there, Teresa. You may have this ability to give advice. You may be an excellent counselor. But when you add that spiritual dimension to counseling, I'll tell you, your counseling just moves into a whole new level. When all of a sudden you're not just dealing with flesh and blood. Remember we read today? You're dealing now with spirit as well. And you as a counselor can do this. You're praying and you go, and God drops something into your heart, some special wisdom in it. But you may have that ability, but it finds its fulfillment in Christ. Next, that, that thing, uh, special knowledge or, or special faith or someone who gives you the power to heal. There are people who are doctors, people that are the people who are doctors and nurses. You, God has given you a special ability. I cannot do doctoring. Uh, do you guys watch the Pimple Popper? Does anyone watch? Oh, some of you watch this program? Okay, what program is the Pimple Popper? It's this doctor in the States that deals with, with boils and these kinds of things, and it's a program. It's unbelievably disgusting and attracting at the same time. Like, you can't stand it, and exactly the same time, you can't not watch it. Because this guy, I remember we watched this one, he had a, oh, okay, I'm not going to tell you, I'm going to tell you. Anyway, anyway. It's that satisfying thing when you come along, your 13-year-old teenager who's got a pimple the size of Mount Everest on his cheek, and he's not touching, and you say, just let me handle that for you. Maybe you've never done that before. Parents, as you come into the teen years, you've got great times coming, man. That's great fun. Here, let me get that one for you. Woo! 
poof, whoa. <laughs> there are so many things that may be healing, but there's a supernatural dimension to healing too. And there are people that God has used, and God can use you too. Does anything say here that you need to professionally train to do these things? No, this is a spirit gift that he gives to the body. Okay, now Teresa, get to the next verses right there. Okay, quickly. He gives one person the power to perform miracles, another one to prophesy, the next other to ability to know whether it really is the spirit of God. That's the discernment gifts. To another, the spirit uh, that is speaking, speaking other languages, talking in tongues we speak. Another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages. And the, another person is given the ability to interpret what is said. Next verses. So is everyone a prophet, apostle, a prophet, or teachers? Do all have the power of miracles? Does everyone have the gift of healing? Of course not. God gives, does God give all us the ability to speak in unknown languages? Can everyone interpret unknown languages? No. Next verse. And in any event, you should desire the most helpful gifts. Okay, let's move down to the verses in Romans now. Just as it is with, that, with each of us that has one body, many members, these members do not all have the same function. We, we, in Christ, we are many who form one body, one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Keep, keep going. We have different gifts. Prophesying, serving, teaching. Next one encouraging, giving generously, leadership, mercy. God has given gifts to each of you from a great variety. This is Peter writing. Okay, this is, last time was Paul, but now this is Peter. Same kind of language. God has given gifts to each of you from the great variety of spiritual gifts. Manage them well so that God's, generously, gener that, so that God's generosity can flow through you. A speaker speaking, are you called to help? Do it with all your strength and energy, and God will be given glory in everything through Jesus Christ. So what gifts have you been given? If you don't know, which you might not, there are all kinds of ways to discover. In fact, I'm going to, on our Facebook page, I'm going to post a spiritual gifts quiz. And you can just go on there, and you can follow the quiz, and you can find out. Has anyone ever done that before? Anybody? Yes, yeah, some of you have. Okay. Yeah, some of you have. Now, I, I really am thankful for one of our Bible college professors. His name is Andrew Gabriel. He passed, he, he teaches at our college. In, he's part of our family. And he says this, God did not create these as a technical category, a limited box called spiritual gifts. Rather, God talks them about gifts, in the sense, gifts, as a sense of that there are many ways that God can use you and enable you to do, um, to do ministry. There are many different ways. This is not an exhaustive list. If you don't look, if you go through this list and go, oh, well, that's not me. I'm not any of those things. Well, that's not the point. What's the point? The point is this. God has a plan for you. He wants to use you. You have purpose. You have meaning. You are needed here. And God wants us to move forward. So maybe you are a giver. Maybe you have faith. Maybe you have the hospitality from 1 Peter 4 verse 9. The they call it, I, in this one study, they called the, the hospitality the team mom. <laughs> the spirit given and driven ability to join Jesus at his work, providing others with a warm and welcoming environment for the purpose of a relationship in places like your home and your workplace. You're just welcoming. You're just one of those, ah, I haven't seen you since yesterday. Oh, I love to see you. How are you? How was your night last night? Oh, my goodness, I'm so glad. You, very well, may not just be a positive person. You may have a gift of hospitality that the Lord just wants to fuel into his kingdom's use. On and on and on and on. And man, it's already time to quit. And I just want to I just want to dive into this stuff this morning, but I, I, we just don't have time. Janelle Howitz writes this: "The purpose of God giving us spiritual gifts is clear." She quotes from 1 Corinthians 12:7, "A spiritual gift is given to us so that we can help each other, so that we can help each other. Spiritual gifts are given so that we can help each other. Point to someone in the room. Point to someone in your house. 
God has given you spiritual gifts to help that person. Point at them. Some of you are not pointing. I'm asking you to point. Point. Point at me. God has given you to me to help, to do what he wants to do. We're the church gathered this morning, but we're still the church on Monday morning. We're still Yorkton Dream Center on Wednesday. We're just scattered. We're just doing what God has called us to do. We're here getting equipped, getting encouraged, praying together, asking God to do something in our lives. But when we walk out these doors, we just don't turn on the TV and just sit on our our God-given rear end until the next week. We are involved in the ministry. And if we don't know our gifts, then we need to be involved. We are not given spiritual gifts, she writes, so that we can feel good about ourselves. We are not given spiritual gifts so we can look good to others. We are not given spiritual gifts to manipulate or get our own way. God gives us gifts so that we can help each other. That's her. I want to pray that this year we would teach you to walk in the gift that God has given you, that you could be a part of the building that God has. Yes, there are tasks. We need people to work with our kids. We need people to run our sound. We need people to help with Dreamland. We need people to, to do the things of cleaning the snow and looking after the building. We need people for that. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. It's what we do when we're God's people in our community. When we discover two houses down that there's a lady over there who's just had a miscarriage and is dying and alone and doesn't know why her life has a purpose and we can represent Jesus' purposes and love in his heart to her. And on and on and on. I just can't beg you enough that you are needed, that God has placed you in his family. Yes, you are his building but he has not put us to be a block on the wall and you just stay there. You have a task that God has given. We're going to dive that out. We want to flesh that out. But I want to beg you, please, would you say to the Lord, God, would you use me today? God, would you use me? As I close, this past week, a singer who has been a hero of mine for a long time named Carmen died. His name is Carmen. And, he, and when I was in the 80s, he did the most crazy stuff. He told kind of these narrative songs. He would sing these songs. And, and, and one of them was the champion. And every youth group in the 80s and the 90s, even now, will take the, the champion and use it. If you've never listened to it, it's on my personal Facebook page. Or just Google it. Or you can even go to, to, to YouTube and Google Carmen the Champion, and you'll we'll watch it there. It's, it's just a, it's a great thing. Anyway, I was listening to his music this week because he passed away. 65. 65. He passed away. A really unexpected. A hernia. Complications from a hernia. Died. And I was listening to his music and being very nostalgic because I bought all of his cassette tapes. <laughs> Back in the day, I have them all. Paid $11 for them from the Christian bookstore in my town for Carmen's cassette tapes and and uh, he has this song that he sings, and he says, uh, he talks about how he believes in God the Father, God the Son, but then he comes into this chorus, and in the chorus, in the chorus he, j- he just says, God, I, I just want to serve you. I, I, wanna, I want your life to use, be used. I want my life to be used by you. God, uh, I just want, I just desire very much, Lord, that in this, this following you, God, that you would allow me to be, to be a, a joy and a blessing to you, oh God. And, and I listened to the words, and I was so moved by it, because that's my sermon, that God has a place for all of you, and everyone is necessary and vital. Please stop sitting on the bench or saying to yourself you're not needed. Please stop telling us. God has a ministry of prayer for some of you. God has a ministry of supernatural healing. God has a ministry of giving wisdom. God has a ministry for you. I would like to flesh these all out and talk to you about them. They're amazing that God has given some of you mercy gifts. God has given you generous gifts. This past week, we had someone from our church family show up to our house and drop off a box of love. (laughs) 
That's all I can say. It was just a box of love. I was thinking of you, they said, and I just bought all this stuff, and I just wanted to give it to you. And it meant the world to us because that person has a gift of giving. What God, what gift has God given you? You all have one. And if you're not sure, then let us help you discover it so that you can walk as part of his family and his building. From now until the Lord returns or he calls me home. Amen. Amen. Jesus, for the gifts of faith and the mercy and leadership and discernment and exhortation and giving and knowledge and administration gifts and wisdom and supernatural gifts, speaking in tongues, being filled with the Spirit, helping others to, to be free, to be supernaturally healed for those who have the gift of helps, as Romans chapter 12, verse 7 says, serving, ministry of helps, assistance. God, we pray that you would rise up the knowledge of us today that we are needed, that we are necessary. And even when the enemy has taken our body, and even when the enemy has made life difficult, we are still a necessary and vital part of the body of Christ. Maybe it's calling us to prayer and intercede like we've never done before. Maybe it's to have gifts of faith like we've never experienced. As long as we have breath, we have purpose in your kingdom. Until you call me home. Or you return. Lord, I will serve you. Lord, I will serve you. God, do your healing in people's lives here this morning. I just pray that the years that the enemy has taken and lied and, and told them that they're worthless and they're useless, God, I pray that they would know this day your love and your value upon them, that you created them, and that, God, you got purpose and meaning, and that you've given them gifts, I ask in Jesus' name. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, be majesty, be power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. And we all said together, and you online, join me. Amen. 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 Thanks for coming to the service today.